uh, Ellen Marsden from the University of Vermont. She'll be presenting on uh, spatial depth distribution of wild and stock juvenile lake trout in Lake Champlain. Thank you, Chris. Um, so if you were here for Rosalie's talk, uh, you've heard some of the background here, but I'll repeat it for those of you who came in. Um, basically, Pascal, this is Pascal Wilkins' um, uh, master's thesis. It's actually the lesser part. His main thesis had to do with uh, uh, growth and uh, recruitment of lake trout in Lake Champlain. Um, and this was, I won't say an afterthought, but it was something that came up while he was doing his main thesis. So he defended his thesis in December, promptly got a job with New York DEC, uh, and in January he left for Dunkirk, and here I am uh, doing his talk for him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Lake Trout in Lake Champlain, as I say, there was a, a little bit of introduction already. Um, this is a fish that, um, unlike the Great Lakes, it disappeared by 1900, we're not entirely sure why. It was a commercial fishery, it was small, it was shoreline based, it was sailing only, and it was only in small portions of the lake, so that doesn't seem to be entirely the culprit. Um, so sustained stocking began, there were, there were other attempts to restore them uh, or, or, or bring them into the lake, but the sustained stocking started in 73. Um, it was much higher prior to lamprey control, and it got lamprey control under control, uh, started to suppress lamprey, they dropped the uh, uh, stocking rate, and it's about 84,000 uh, individuals um, introduced per year. Um, they do adult assessments, when I say they, the state of, of Vermont does adult assessments at two sites. Um, one of them is up here at the northern part of the main lake, one of them is down here at the southern part of the main lake, and that's the only assessment they do. And they have not found, even till today, uh, any wild spawners at those sites, at least no, you know, one percent of the, the, the number you might expect from areas in Clipping. But um, they haven't done juvenile surveys. And so without the juvenile survey, you don't know whether any recruitment has been happening. When I joined Vermont in the uh, University of Vermont uh, in, in the late 90s, we started doing um, early life history work, seeing if there were spawning areas. And we found spawning happening pretty much everywhere in the lake, that there were rocky reefs, and there were rocky reefs everywhere in the lake. That reproduction, that is to say egg deposition, was yielding fry, so we know these fish have been reproducing successfully ever since we started looking basically about 20 uh, plus years ago. The problem is that intermediate stage of recruitment. So we know that if you stock these fish at one year old, they take off and they do just fine. And we know that they show up at spawning areas, they produce eggs, they produce fry. There's that gap between the fry and the end of the first year of life and recruitment into the second year. So we began uh, doing uh, juvenile trawls in 2015 and it was really a matter of sheer luck. It's not that recruitment was happening all along but rather we found recruitment when we started looking that had obviously just begun. And I can give you a longer argument about how we know that that's the case. Basically, we've been trawling every two to four weeks or two to three weeks throughout the ice-free season, concentrated in the central portion of the lake, which is here, and then three, two or three times a year we go north, we go south, and we look in extensively to see where these fish, these, these juvenile fish are. Now, one of the things you might realize if you do this kind of work, we do it for five years, we can't keep it up. That's unsustainable. It's expensive to go out on the trawl and do these long day, you know, one day trips north and south, extensive trawling every two or three days in the main lake. So one of the things that struck us is we've got to transition this to basically a maintenance program, if you will. How do we continue to assess recruitment of the each successive year class of, and, and survival of the last year classes of lake trout without beating our brains out and trawling that often. So what's happened in those last five years, just to fill in a little bit more of the background, is that we've seen a very steady increase in the proportion of uh, the juveniles. And juveniles, the, the, the only fish that recruit to the trawl are ages zero to three. So juveniles are sort of redefining, meaning that group, even though four and five and six-year-olds are, are technically uh, juveniles, they usually don't spawn by then. Um, it did drop in this last year. Now, is that just a blip, or is something bad happening? I'm going to be positive and think it's just one of those blips. It's been remarkably good up until now, steadily increasing every year. So we've got a lot of natural recruits out there. So, just again, as a background before I get to Pascal's stuff, what's the spatial distribution? We've been looking north to work near the northerly uh, spawning site, that, that's one of the major spawning sites where uh, uh, assessment takes place, and all the way to the south where the southern uh, spawning site where assessment takes place. So let's take a look at how that works out in terms of spatial distribution. If we look at the total catch per unit effort, that's the stock 
plus the wild recruits. The picture we see is the South seems to have the highest catch per unit effort, the Central Lake moderate catch per unit effort. There's not much going on in the North. Okay, well, maybe that's because we're getting uh, 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 disparate uh, 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 production of juveniles at the two um, spawning sites. Well, then if we look at the percentage of wild fish, where, what proportion of the catch per unit ever is actually the wilds, they're all in the central lake. There are a bunch in the north, not very many in the south. What's with that? You would expect exactly the opposite. They're coming off, if they're coming off those two spawning reefs, they ought to be most abundant in the north and the south, and least abundant in the main lake. Well, the awful truth is we haven't really looked for spawning areas in the main lake very much. It's big, not compared to the Great Lakes, but it's big for us, and probably the spawning is occurring offshore. So that's why we've got Matt Fuchsia who's going to tell us what's happening offshore in the main lake in the next few years. But for the moment, all we know is that the distribution of the wild fish is asymmetrical. That is to say, it's in the main lake, it's not north and south. That's two-dimensionally. What about the third dimension? Do we know anything about whether there's differences in the behavior of these fish with respect to depth as well as and, and temperature, as well as with respect to uh, location in the lake? So our questions were first ecologically, to what extent are these wild juveniles that we now have in huge abundance, we can catch them pretty much any day of the week and year, um, is there any difference in the way they behave and the way they distribute themselves, ecologically, if you will, with respect to temperature and depth, relative to their stocked congeners that had a very different early life history in a hatchery than the wild ones did. So let's look at uh, uh, different habitats based on thermal or depth preferences. Um, um, does this change seasonally? Obviously the, 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 the temperature profile with respect to depth changes seasonally. Are the lake trout responding to that? And is it different between the wild and the stock? From a management standpoint, as I say, we can't sustain the intensive stumping we've been doing. So if we're going to design a really good juvenile survey, what would it look like in terms of depth, temperature, and season? We can minimize effort and maximize data, which we always want to do, right? And of course, that would be relevant just for not uh, uh, relevant not just for Lake Champlain, but could inform what's being done in the Great Lakes as they inform what we're doing. So um, now we're just going to switch to just the main lake. That's one of the most intensive sampling that's being done. And in the main lake, what we were doing, um, all right, with the Bryans here, any of the Bryans here, you'll laugh at my lovely straight lines. Sure, that's exactly what our trolls look like. <laughs> now, we were sort of weaving our way in our 10 and 20 minute trolls, trying, well, the captain was trying to follow those contours. And in an effort to do every five meters, okay, really more like every 10 meters, starting at about 30 meters and working our way down the bank to about 60 meters. And those would be every day we went out, one, two, three, four, five down the bank, one, two, three, four, five down the bank. And then we, of course, we would assess the data based on the depth of the trawl or the mean depth of each trawl. So if we look at the data, each trawl was, uh, um, we, we did the data analysis by trawl, each trawl was categorized by the catch per unit depth of wild, catch per unit depth of, of stock. Um, we had the mean depth of the trawl. As I say, you know, sometimes we'd drop the trawl in 30 meters, we'd end up at 50 meters, but we knew we spent most of the time at, 20, uh, 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 at say 45 meters, and that would be what we called the mean depth. So you know, there's a little bit of, of fuzz to this, you might say. Um, we had the temperature because we had a net meter, uh, uh, um, uh, we either had a meter on the net that told us the temperature during that trawl, or we put a CTD down and, and say, we know what depth of the trawl was, so what was the temperature right there. And then we categorized each trawl into whether it was pre-thermocline formation, during the thermocline, during stratification, or post-stratification. And we basically said stratification is when your variance between your epilimnion and, and hypolimnion is, uh, is more than five degrees, which is a little arbitrary, but it worked when we looked at our data. So um, then what Pascal did is, is he bootstrapped, he could take the data from each of the categories it got, bootstrapped it and make 100 rep, uh, 1,000 replicates, and then made confidence intervals with all of those, rep, those bootstrap replicates. And then what I'll show you are the confidence intervals for the distribution of fish by depth and by temperature using those um, bootstrap data. So what we've got here, we've got, this is a, a, a distribution by temperature, by season. So temperatures on the x-axis, the panels are giving you pre, during, and post stratification periods, the wild, and we've got the stocks. And so this is the probability density as determined by those bootstrap samples. Look at the vertical lines, which are the uh, 
mean distribution and the confidence intervals. So what we've got here is the, um, if you're looking for overlap between the stockfish and the wild fish, if, they overlap, if the confidence intervals overlap, we're saying there's no difference between the wild and the stockfish. If they don't overlap, something different is happening, they're behaving differently. So when we're talking about temperature, during the pre- and post-trafication season, basically they're in the same place at the same time. They're not showing any temperature preference. But during the stratified season, when obviously there's much more choice about where you go with respect to temperature, there is not an overlap. The wild fish are uh, selecting warmer water or they're in warmer water. The stock fish are uh, selecting cooler water or they're being pushed to cooler water. You know, we can't tell whether it's exclusion or not. Is that based on depth? I mean, obviously you can seek your temperature just by changing what depth you're in during the stratified season. Um, basically, no. There, is, there are not overlapping confidence intervals at all seasons with respect to depth. The wild fish tend to stay a little bit shallower much of the time, and the stockfish are staying a little bit deeper. So the broad answer, and as I say, it's kind of a short and sweet question that answered pretty briefly, yes, wild fish are behaving differently from the stockfish. So part of the question then is, is this due to their background and what implicate, you know, in, in terms of their uh, rearing um, habitat, and what implications does that have for us designing a, uh, a longer term monitoring um, sampling design? So there's differences. The wild are more abundant at 30, 40 meters. The stocks are more abundant deeper at 45 to 55. The wild are in warmer water down to about 6.5 to 8.5, whereas the, uh, the stockfish tend to stay cooler. Now, where do they grow up, right? The stockfish are growing up in a standard, stable temperature of 10 degrees, and they're learning to feed from the sky, okay? Um, they're being introduced suddenly into a universe where they've got to seek food um, and, and they're realizing they're exhausting their stored resources because it takes them, they, I should say, they're stocked mostly in November and, and really are not starting to feed as far as we can tell until spring. They've got a huge lipid resource, they exhaust most of that lipid resource just surviving the first winter. And it's possible then that they are seeking colder temperatures because they're not feeding in that first winter. They're, as I said, they're just relying on what they've got, and they can um, reserve the energy reserve that they've got, the energy storage they've got, by staying colder. And that behavior may stay with them throughout their early life as they learn to feed, but they learn to also um, keep their metabolism slow. That's one of many hypotheses, but that's one we've been sort of playing with, you might say. Um, and that's, sorry, I, I should have said, that's a, basically gives you um, um, what I just said. The wild fish are, the wild fish that we know where the spawning sites are, are, are being spawned at shallow spawning sites. So it's possible, again, that history of, of an acquaintance with the lake environment being shallow influences where they remain when they start moving offshore. They're staying shallower for whatever reason, the stockfish are going deeper. Even though the, the stockfish, by the way, I should say, they're stocked near shore, they're also stocked in the center of the lake um, off ferries. So they have a choice of habitats. Uh, post stocking. Um, in terms of assessment, if we want to continue to assess how recruitment is, you know, is taking off, at what year class strength is like of each of our new wild year classes uh, coming into the lake population, we have to have unbiased data. We have to know we're in places that are either preferred by stock or by wild. Well, so it looks pretty straightforward from what we've got seasonally and depth and temperature preferences. We can do one of two things. In the pre and post uh, uh, season, if we go to the same um, um, temperature, we know that we can find wild and, and, and uh, stocked lake trout in the same places. But they're pretty much overlapping by temperature. It might be a little bit different by depth, but if we go <coughs> and put our CTD down first, we can find the right place to be. Alternatively, a little bit more work, but it's in a nicer season to work. We can sample in the middle of summer, but then we're going to have to sample our multiple trawls down the bank. And that can be useful because we may see changes in distributions as these populations continue to, to grow. So we can go from every two to three weeks to probably sampling two to three times a year and get a very good estimate of how, uh, how recruitment is continuing and year class strength is, uh, is being hopefully maintained each successive year. Um, so with that, um, I've got a number of people to thank. Uh, this was not done obviously without a lot of help on the boat. Captain Fluitt, who many of you know, and who has unfortunately 
uh, just trolled his last troll and hung up his last uh, um, um, trolling gear uh, was incredibly instrumental. This would be impossible without him because he knows, he knows how to deploy a troll. We had an excellent crew, we had a lot of graduate students, undergraduate students, and help from a lot of people. And thanks to all. And particular thanks, of course, to the Great East Fishery Commission and Senator Leahy for leveraging the funds that allow us to do all of this work. Um, and so with that, um, I will open it up to any questions.